everyone. Uh, Jeff, thanks for joining. It's uh, it's great to reconnect with you as, as you and I were talking on the uh, the prep for this. Um, it's been a while since we were both at both at GE, but I can tell you we're we're both big fans, and particularly Jeff, who's our who's our honored guest today, of healthcare and technology. So since we're talking to a whole bunch of experts, uh, you know, pr providers, caregivers, pays, and startups, uh, Jeff, I'd love to get your perspective, whether it's through your GE career or you know now as being an advisor uh, in the in the tech and healthcare firm. What are some of the big trends? in healthcare that you're hearing and maybe in particular you know you know the technology side the pharma side whichever side you want to go to but the, what what do you see kind of as the big picture things driving us right now yes yeah, steve it's great to be with you and it's great to talk about healthcare i always had an interesting context uh, from ge because we were both an innovator in the industry but we're also a big payer we had a huge retiree base and employee base in the us so both were important and both informed uh, my thinking. Uh, I wanted to continue in healthcare. That's why I joined vent a venture capital firm that has a big footprint there, you know, Steve. Mm -hmm. And I would just start by just talking about how massive healthcare is, you know, as an industry. Uh, just kidney disease alone is bigger than digital advertising, right? So that always blows people's minds in terms of Bonkers. Yes. how fast it is. It's very complicated. And that's one of the things that makes it so investable, so there were like $30 billion that were invested in venture just in the first quarter of 2021. So this remains a vibrant industry. I'd say, I'd say five things that ca capture uh, my thinking or our thinking right now is just um, next generation drug discovery. There's probably something like 5,000 proteins that are in development right now that could potentially uh, be great, uh, uh, very efficacious uh, therapies in the future. Uh, the second thing is, is kind of the use of artificial intelligence and technology, primarily in drug discovery, to, to talk about how drugs are prescribed, how they're developed, how they're manufactured. I think that remains uh, very robust. Uh, the third one is kind of the, the unbundling of healthcare services. You know, this has gone through waves of development as time goes on, but you know, there's a, there's a couple big providers or hospitals that can still keep all the services inside their four walls. But the vast uh, majority, the vast trend is decoupling uh, radiology and, and primary care and kidney treatment and things like that. So that's a very robust uh, long-term trend. Uh, number four is value-based care. So this whole notion of how do you go at risk? How do you how do you improve outcomes and do it at a lower cost? And this is something that you know both I, I would say payers and providers are spending a lot of time uh, thinking about. And the last one is what I would just generally call uh, physician enablement. You know, I, I think we we went through a long period of time trying to pretend like. Physicians didn't matter in healthcare delivery, like everybody else, the CIO or the CEO or everybody else right. mattered. And, and I think this whole notion of physician enablement, how do we give them tools that make them better? There's shortages in many practice areas. And I think, uh, so these are the kind of the five places that, uh, that I would say, Steve, are seeing lots of time and attention and investment dollars in 2021. Uh, you know, yeah. post COVID, things like telehealth is clearly uh, critical. But you know, you know, what I remind people is like telehealth has been around for thirty years. Mm -hmm. For most of that time, it's been a crappy place to invest, and you know, kind of COVID brought it to a new level. Yeah, right. and that's not going to go away. That's not going to go away. The whole notion of virtual care is just not going to go away. So that's those are a few things I'd be thinking about if I were in the audience today. So Jeff, I, I was always blown away by you know you met, you mentioned the size of of the healthcare business. I mean, in, you know, in, in GE, I think at the time we left it, you know, it was north of a twenty billion dollar a year business. I mean, just po po positively massive. Can you talk a little bit about the the complexity of of the industry? I mean, you you got this interweaving of you know you've got government, you've got regulations, you've got you know all the you know the the, the payers, you know, just the providers. It's just it's a crazy, you know, we're going to talk about a little bit about leadership and how you can personally get involved, but what are some of the ways innovators can navigate 
some of that and how, you know, how, if you want to be a change agent, which is hopefully what the majority of this audience wants to be in whatever their, whatever their role is, what, 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 what are the areas or how could you attack maybe some of your areas here uh, in terms of innovation and maybe help drive some of these changes and transitions? Yeah, you know, Steve, I, I think you, you said the watchword, you have to embrace complexity. Uh, several years ago, you know, like JP Morgan, Berkshire Hathaway, and Amazon yep. ostensibly came together to fix healthcare. That didn't even capture, you know, I love all three right. CEOs and I think right. all amazing companies. They didn't come close. I with all because, they didn't know, come close. The, the, com the complexity of healthcare always wins. It's, yep. it's, it's, you know, the consumers is disconnected from the payer. The government is engaged in every way. Every city and town is different, you know. So, so I can go down the list of all the things that are, that are different about healthcare. You know, the fact is, is that tech has had almost no impact in healthcare. By tech, I mean Microsoft, Google, Amazon. Yep. Uh, Epic is the big winner, but but mainly because Epic understands complexity. They they know how to manage through it. So, I think Steve, it's it's people that understand that are are really critical. So. If you're, if you're a, let's say a big provider, big insurance company, uh, something like that, you, you know how to make complexity an advantage, but you can't sit still. So if you look at the really great, let's say, I, I've always had a lot of respect for United Healthcare. United Healthcare, despite the fact that they, they, they really leverage complexity to their advantage, they're always innovating. They're always trying new things. They're always trying to figure out how to, how to get ahead. And so they play defense and offense, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're an innovator, you know, there's like, I've never sat through one healthcare presentation that I didn't think was a good idea, but I've sat through lots of presentations where I didn't think it was investable, right? Cause yeah. <laughs> I, I always ask two questions, to the innovator, who's going to pay for it. So if it's not an insurance company or the government or somebody, it's not going to last long. And how are you going to sell it? Because healthcare really is door to door selling as much mm -hmm. as I would hate to admit it. But, uh, you know, I'm in Charleston right now. The fact is, is that Medical University of South Carolina and Roper, the two big systems in Charleston, you know, they're in the same town, but they don't have a lot in common. They don't work together that well, you know, so yeah. uh, figuring out the go to market is critically important. And that's what keeps a lot of innovations uh, from getting to market. But learning to manage complexity and making it your friend is really is really critical. Could, could you dig in a little bit more to the unbundling aspect? Is that, it, it, it sounds like that might be a pathway to try and improve innovation and that you can focus on maybe areas of areas of care or even areas of delivery. It's, it's Do you think very, that's a potential good. path people could think of? It's a great question. It's one that's really, you know, I'll try to do it in very quick fashion. Sure. But, you know, fundamentally, like there are no really successful freestanding AI companies in healthcare. It doesn't, you know, there should be. There's a mm -hmm. ton of data. There's lots of repetitive work. In many ways, artificial intelligence and machine learning are really, uh, uh, could be really leverageable in healthcare, but without attaching an outcome to it you know, you can never really get the full advantage. So there's lots of investments in artificial intelligence companies in healthcare that have failed. Mm -hmm. So the way to get around that is to pick, you know, pick primary care, pick radiology, right? Yeah. So if you can look at radiology across, and let's say, I think there's something like, uh, oh, there's 20 or 30,000 radiologists, maybe more, you know, in terms of uh, uh, how you think about it. If you can lay down horizontal technology, if you can make practice areas common, if you can make tools common, if you can find a way to achieve some kind of scale around a practice area that really delivers healthcare and associates a payment with it, that's the way you can kind of crack the code on new technology tools and the complexity of how the work gets done. And I would say, Steve, we're in very early. Yeah extremely early innings of that of that development area but that is one way using technology that you can hopefully get you know better outcomes at lower cost yeah i, I can remember it, it's you know, some of our early ge projects try trying to map out exactly what you said like okay who's gonna who's gonna pay for it who's gonna benefit from it who's involved in that food chain 
that has to approve it or be involved, whether, you know, is it the CIO, is it the finance? Every idea is a good idea, right? There's nothing, and and the people that work in healthcare are amazing, they're dedicated, Mm -hmm. but lots of good ideas die because, you know, they just don't get there. Again, I go back to, I can't even tell you you, how many decades where people have said to me, I'm better than Epic. I have more modern technology. I can do more. And, and I say, look, that's not the point. The point yeah. is they've done it. They've done it hospital by hospital, town by town in a meaningful way. And unless you can duplicate that in some area, you're not going to get there. Right. And that's, mm-hmm. I'd say that's the reality. I wouldn't call it bad or good. That's just the reality of healthcare. Yeah. Let, let, let me let me take a little a, a little twist and uh, maybe get into people and maybe how to how to think through some of the stuff. So what are your thoughts on employee engagement? Let's go like right down to the floor with the healthcare providers. Again, going back to some of our GE projects, it was we were always challenged to get, you know, the leadership and the funding and then the experts. But, you know, get to the people on the floor, the providers, you know, the technicians and the lab assistants and things like that. What, 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 what are your thoughts on employee engagement? Cause you know, you've got a lot of leaders here who obviously, you know, span over big employee bases. Yeah, see, you know, great question. I, I would make a, a couple of comments. When I used to do sales calls, when I worked at GE, regardless of the industry, I would always work my way up the organization. So I would t- talk yep. to the people who were buying our products I would talk to the middle level management and then I would end up in the CEO's office. And I, I would always kind of like ask two things of the CEO, you know, kind of like, what's your connection to the front line? You know, and, and I, I would say like, what can I learn from you? Like, what's your connection with the front line and how can I learn from you in that regard? And the second question is, how do you spend your time? And, and I think over the years, there have been some healthcare CEOs both the big and small companies, providers, payers, who have really cracked the code of how to get into, you know, what does a doctor do? What does a nurse do? What does a radiology technician do? So it's not some abstraction. Mm-hmm. And then most healthcare leaders, look, they're, they're politicians, they're fundraisers. They have a thousand other jobs to do other than just running the place. And so I find the best leaders have a good sense for you know, um, how to do that. You know, uh, I'll just throw out one name because you get that a lot. I don't want to get in trouble. But, you know, Warner Thomas has run Oshner for a long time. It's a great system. He's always been a leader that I, I, I admired because of the way he did his job, right? Yeah. And I think there's, there's a necessity there. Now, Steve, the other comment I would make for everybody who's in this uh, seminar, which is, you know, over time, let's say over the next 10 years, I'd say 30 to 40% of Americans are going to go to work in the healthcare sector, right? Wow. So 30 to 40%. All the, yeah. All the conversation. So it's, it's, it's 20 or 25% of the GDP, you name it. Mm-hmm. And it's more labor intensive than tech or other industries. So just do the math. And so I, I think, you know, whereas let's say 30 years ago or 40 years ago, when I started my career, industrial companies were where most modern leadership techniques were developed and then it was financial services and then it was tech i think in the next 20 years most modern leadership techniques are going to have to come out of the healthcare sector because that's where most people are going to go to work and i just don't think the sector itself thinks enough about it there's not enough degrees around it there's mm-hmm. not enough work that's going into it and i think steve that's where you know kind of the the work is because it's you know it's just Look, you and I, we were talking earlier, I just um, had my Achilles tendon repaired, right? Uh, uh, and the, the place I did it, did an awesome job, but I never once thought a robot was gonna do it. You know? like, yeah. Like I never once, getting from there, getting into physical therapy, all that stuff. And I just think that's the nature yeah. of healthcare. It's hands-on, it's human, and it's gonna stay that way for a long, long time. It's going to be that way. Well, and and w- w- what I thought you were going to say too is all, all those baby boomers getting to the point where you know stuff starts to stuff starts to break down. I I think if I can quote you, it sucks getting older. So where you know every everybody's getting aches and pains, and I suspect the majority of people on this uh, on this webinar are, are are younger than you and I. But you obviously you know the trends are in place, right? You know you can't you know demographics 
can't change. I mean, certainly not over the short term. And I would say, see, you know, I, I teach a little bit at Stanford Business School. I think business schools don't do the job. They don't, they don't educate enough of their students on healthcare, on healthcare leadership. And so I just think there's a huge vacuum out there given the bow wave of employment that's going to yep. come into the sector. Well, let's 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 go in that direction a little bit. I mean, because we obviously can talk about tech and all those things, and I bet these people are are pretty knowledgeable to that. But I find it it is fascinating. You know, you you, you know, you brought up the the J.P. Morgan, Amazon, and Microsoft alliance, which like fell apart. What, what why? You know, there's a lot of investment, but you don't read about it. You don't hear about it. I mean, I've you know, you know, I I still work with a a lot of teams and a lot of companies through my through my private consulting business and. Healthcare is like what you know. We, you know we're into finance and tech and AI, and we want to be the next Google. What what is it going to take? You know, you know. It's great that the audience here today, they get it. They're committed. They're in the they're in the business. What what is it about leadership in the? You know, I don't know if it's in the country or the world that we've got to start talking about to get more people to want to put their energy and activity into into making healthcare better. Yeah, I think, Steve, you know, again, it goes back to the complex. People look for easy answers to a lot of different things. There's just no easy answer to healthcare, And so I think some of it is just societal and cultural in that regard. I think the other one is uh, it requires kind of a combination of short-term and long-term thinking. I mean, yeah. one of the things that you and I worked on together was a portfolio of innovation, right? You need some that are going to be 12 months out, but some are going to be 10 years out. And mm -hmm. And I think in healthcare, investors don't always sign up for the fact that this could be a 10-year journey or a 15-year journey. You know, um, the vaccines were amazing. They, they happened in less than a year. One of the reasons why they happened in less than a year is because there were 15 years or right. 20 years of work in it, mRNA and other- Already, companies. right, right. It was already in the bank. Therapeutics that were already in place. And so- I just think that, you know, tech looks easier, right? It looks, it, looks, um, it looks easier than healthcare. Healthcare is complicated and it takes a long time. I go back, Steve, to what I talked about telehealth. You know, I think in most areas, change happens slowly and then all at once. Telehealth wasn't exciting really for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And then it became exciting. So all the companies that kind of stayed the course for all that period of time, they look like heroes because all of a sudden this was the only way you could get it took off, get work done. So I, I think I think we got to teach people that they've got to invest a, across a portfolio. They have to continue to to go. And and I would say the same thing, like particularly if you're on the provider side, um, you get punished in this industry if you move too quickly, right? If you so you're sitting there right now if you own a life. So there's something like 30 million lives that are in value-based care, but there's a lot of lives in art. And if you go before you're ready, you're gonna get crushed, right? Yep. And if you're too late, you're gonna lose market share. And so sometimes <laughs> the hardest thing for leaders to decide is kind of like when to, when, to, uh, when to do that. And it's hard to do, it's hard to do an ROI on any investment when you have no idea the dimension of time. So I think you're better off triangulating, you know, classic ROI discussions mm -hmm. with different scenarios that paint, hey, it could take 10 years, it could take three years. Yep. Here's the size it gets to. And I just think uh, that has to be learned or taught uh, for people that are investing in the sector. It does. I, if, if I could just pull out maybe for, for our audience, what Jeff's referring to about the portfolio, I think is absolutely a critical skill. Yeah, we, we, we chopped ours in GE, and I still do this with clients. I was on a big call yesterday with a bunch of executives. There's a three horizon model. We're not going to take the time to do it. Horizon one, horizon two, horizon three, close in, adjacent, and basically, you know, blue ocean or, or something like that. Go, go look it up. You can find it from McKinsey or Harvard Business School. But I think what Jeff's saying is really, really critical in terms of, you know, if you don't have a portfolio approach, sure, some stuff's going to pay out tomorrow. But other stuff could take a much longer investment. Doesn't make it less important, right? It it makes it 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 might be critically important to get yeah. to get at that. So I definitely put in a plug for that. I think so, Steve, for the small companies that for the small companies that are listening today, some of you are going to position yourselves to be acquired by bigger companies. That's that's not a bad thing, you know. And some mm -hmm. of you want to go all the way, right? But if you want to go all the way, 
you got to raise a ton of money, right? So don't don't ever cheat yourself in terms of don't run out of money while you're waiting for the FDA to move or something else in healthcare because nothing happens quickly. Yeah, no, it does. And, and on that very point, for because uh, I know we have a lot of startups in here, what suggestions on them working with some of the big behemoths? You know, if you're at, you know, you, you know, you mentioned United Healthcare and Oshner and people, people like that. Suggestions for how do you get you to self discovered? How do you listen? Do you partner up? What, what, you know, do you come to seminars like this? What, what advice could you give? Because clearly the big firms want that innovation, right? But they're not necessarily the ones who are going to invent it. So, Steve, you know, I teach a 12 class course at, at uh, the GSB at Stanford, second year students. And I have six startup CEOs and I have six, let's say, uh, legacy CEOs, right? Okay. And one of the startup CEOs is always around the decision of, do you take an investment from a big, from a big company or walk away, right? And there's yep. no, there's no, no easy answer, is there? <laughs> there's no easy answer. I, I would say in um, for a healthcare startup, you got to partner with somebody that gives you distribution. You know, let's say you have a good innovation. Go. Distribution mm -hmm. is really hard in healthcare, really hard, yep. because very little of it is aggregated. So I always think it's it's never a bad thing for somebody to take an investment for somebody that that um, has distribution. You know, uh, Steve, like. Um, when, when you and I worked together, when I retired, we had 45,000 salespeople in the company. Yep, right? yep. And, and a startup might have three. Yep. So you're sitting there saying, look, there's a lot of things you can say that are bad about a big company like GE, but having, let's say, we probably had 5,000 healthcare salespeople. Having 5,000 healthcare salespeople Unbelievable. is really, really important. Now, Jeff, I, you know, I, can remember, I can remember a startup coming to visit me in New York City when we were looking into, into some of our healthcare innovation ideas. And they were basically begging. They had some really neat technology, but no one would listen to them. Yeah. And so, yeah, a big company you know, like, like GE that's got distribution is invaluable. So I think that's great, great advice. Is the service that goes with it. And look, there's digital tools now that help you uh, create distribution. So this is all gonna change as time goes on. Mm -hmm. But again, healthcare is more risk averse. Uh, they like buying from people. They, they like seeing who they're, they're they buying with. Yeah. Those things change slowly. Value-based care. Every consumer would love to get value-based care. Why, why is it so, frustrating i mean you know i'm sure everyone everyone's got the example of going in and you know it's not covered as a, as a as an individual yeah. over and over again is there any hope to un untangle that complexity and really make value based care yeah, yeah. Steve, so i would say it's still in early days and in order to execute on value based care you have to integrate two systems at the same time which is really hard one of them is you you have to have a very close partnership between a, a uh, let's say a provider, a hospital, and an insurer. Okay. So in some ways, let's say Kaiser Permanente, in some ways kind of is a big example of what should be value-based care. So that's, you know, it's taken uh, Kaiser Permanente 80 years to get to where they are right now. So there's a lot of synthetic uh, value-based care that's been, being put together today. A couple of them that I work with at NEA, and then you have to do it in every city around the country differently. Wow. So South Florida is different than Atlanta. It's different than San Francisco. It's different than Green Bay. So you have like a matrix of integrations that have to take place. And, you know, again, I don't think it's a question of, because really, if you want, if you want healthcare to be better at lower cost without risk sharing or without some kind of like managed risk, it's never mm -hmm. going to get there. So I think, uh, I think that's what, that's what it takes. There's big companies that are trying it. There's startups that are trying it, but it's the Holy grail. And I'd say it's a question of when and not if it's going to take place. Okay. All right. So one, one last question. Then about, I'll, I'll try and do a quick, uh, quick wrap up. Lessons for leaders. You know, you, you ran one of the most complex respected organizations ever. What what lessons could you share as a as a great leader for folks who are, you know, you know, kind of on the precipice of being in that C level themselves or certainly have the desires 
to do that in terms of some of the skills and lessons, which obviously you've written about and talked about a lot, but what, what could you uh, help this audience with? So Steve, I would say uh, three things. I'd say first, uh, the, the importance of connection with your team. I think as these healthcare organizations grow and grow, uh, the leaders of both private industry and not-for-profit hospitals and things like that, you're gonna have to be more of a leader of people and less of a leader of technology. You're gonna have to be more of a business person and less of a politician. <laughs> and so the importance of connection, number one, in terms of how you lead. The second thing is just systems thinking, Steve, this ability to kind of look across multiple domains, multiple time horizons, and be able to pick the right next bets. Some people do that mm -hmm. better than others, but you know, healthcare is gonna change. You have to see the system as it comes together. Part of that is embracing complexity. So I, I think just yep. complexity. And the last one is you got to think long term. You, you know, in other words, um, nothing in this industry is going to happen quickly. It's going to happen slowly and then all at once. So when things happen slowly and then all at once, if you weren't working on it all along, you get killed. <laughs> if you're working on it too much too early, you get in advance, you get killed. <laughs> So there's lots of ways to get killed, but there's a way to get it right. And, and you have to sustain kind of the investment in the bleak days some way and then be ready for when your time comes. And that's kind of the tell of the story. So yeah. those would be the three things I'd recommend. Awesome. Super, super, super. So I, I'm probably not going to do a great job wrapping this up, but let me, let me, let me try and uh, capture some of the thoughts I heard from, from Jeff here that I hope folks would turn away. First of all, I think we're starting and ending with complexity. It's a massively complex industry. And if you don't embrace the fact that it is complex and maybe get some of the system thinking and you're not going to be successful in there. Uh, five major themes I heard about, okay? Next generation drugs. I won't get these probably precisely. The use of AI, you know, to help things like drug advancement and things of that nature. Unbundling of services, number three. Improvement in value-based care. and physician enablement, big, big, big stuff. Uh, I think we heard several times about the importance of connecting with employees. You know, he talked about some of the CEOs he really respected and they, you know, they have a feel for, I call it, you know, the floor, you know, walking the factory floor, walking the hospital floor, I think all the way up to what, uh, what they need there. We talked about, you know, maybe 30 or 40% of the jobs are gonna end up in healthcare within the next one to two decades. So are you prepared for that in terms of investment and thinking? I would really encourage folks to think about what Jeff mentioned about having a portfolio and taking a portfolio approach to what you do. Do you have ideas close in for the next one to two years? Do you have ideas for the next two to five years? And do you have ideas further? And how do you manage those and invest those on a different uh, different time frame? Uh, and then, you know, leadership, connection with your team, being able to have a system thinker who can embrace complexity, and then taking a long-term view on what you're going to do. So. A lot of stuff from a legendary CEO. Uh, fantastic conference. Jeff, thank you so much for, Thanks, uh, for helping us. I'll uh, turn it back to you, turn it back to Kara, but uh, good luck everyone on your, your journey and uh, hope you found this helpful.